The year turned from the winter of 32 BCE to spring 31 BCE. Octavian would be elected consul for 31 BCE, giving him legal command of his grand army. As the winter passed and seas calmed, Octavian launched his attack. While Antony might have had a good chance of beating Octavian, You can't defeat me. He would have a much harder time defeating Agrippa, who was commanding Octavian's navy. No, I know. <sighs> but he can. Agrippa launched the attack, sailing east and gaining a foothold in Greece, where Octavian started landing his ground forces. As Agrippa's navy attacked and weakened coastal communities, Octavian, with his army, overran and captured these cities and were making their way to the coastal city of Actium. At Actium, Octavian's forces finally met Antony's main army, which was larger than his. Octavian and Antony started concentrating their strength at Actium. As a geography teacher, I'm happy to say that geography played an important role in the battle to come. Octavian's forces were on a hill, which would have been tough for Antony to take, even with more men. I have the high ground! Worse for Antony, his forces were in low, watery ground, plagued by mosquitoes. Diseases like malaria and dysentery broke out in Antony's camp, debilitating soldiers and sailors, and even killing some. Some men started to desert Antony's army, wanting to escape with their lives, rather than wasting away, waiting for the battle to come. Summer came, and Antony's forces made moves to cripple Octavian's. He tried to build fortifications that would cut off Octavian's fresh water supply, but Octavian's forces won every minor battle that was fought. Worse for Antony, Agrippa kept up his aggressive naval campaign, destroying many of Antony's transport ships, making it harder for his gigantic army to get supplies. With a few more victories, Agrippa totally controlled the seas and totally cut off Antony from food shipments he needed from Egypt. Antony's forces went inland, demanding communities give the giant army food. Summer wore on, and Antony's position was not improving. He was blockaded by Agrippa at sea, and his army was decaying around him. While still formidable, the longer he stayed, the easier it would be for Octavian to defeat him. Antony's allies were changing sides on him. Some senators who had fled for Antony now rejoined Octavian, and eastern client kings started swearing allegiance to Octavian and brought their forces to him. Where once Antony commanded 500 mighty warships at Actium, he had only enough healthy sailors to man half of them. Ultimately, Antony decided that one of his generals would lead his main army away while he would try to break out at sea with his navy. With that, Antony's legions packed up from their mosquito-infested camps and started marching inland to Greece, surviving until they could fight Octavian in more favorable conditions. This move further hurt Antony's already broken reputation. To the Romans, if the commander was going to make a retreat, he should lead it himself. Antony passed the job to his subordinate. Worse, it played into the narrative that Antony failed to do what was best for Rome so he could do what was best for Cleopatra. Many of these ships he hoped to break out of Agrippa's blockade were hers, and her royal treasury that was financing Antony's operation was on her personal ship. Antony's once 500-ship navy was now inferior to Octavian's 400-ship navy, as he only had enough men to crew about 250 of his ships. Octavian's 400 ships formed into a crescent, ready to engage and intercept Antony's ships that were going to try and escape. Octavian commanded a few ships on the flank, but it was his admiral Agrippa, the man who defeated Sextus Pompey at his own game, who would orchestrate this battle for him. The day of battle began with a lot of waiting. Agrippa waited for Antony to come to him, and Antony waited for the winds to pick up to make a speedy escape. When the winds started to pick up, Antony's ships advanced and the battle began as Agrippa's ships started attacking them. And now it begins. No. Now it ends. In the nautical chaos that followed, Cleopatra's ship saw an opening through Agrippa's navy and was able to speed her way through to Alexandria and safety. <laughs> 
success. Antony watched Cleopatra and her treasury sail away and left his flagship for a smaller ship. He too found an open line to escape and followed her home. About 70 other ships were able to escape with them. The rest fought on, failing to defeat Agrippa before retreating back to the harbor. Agrippa did not pursue Antony and starved out Antony's trapped navy with his blockade. Eventually, they surrendered to him and Antony lost his navy. Not the navy! Antony's legions eventually ran out of supplies and had nowhere to go. Antony had no navy to pick them up with. Rome's armies never fought for the Republic or for any ideal, but for their commander who promised them coin. Antony's army was abandoned by Antony. While Antony's general remained loyal to him, his own officers started to negotiate with Octavian, who generously took them in. If their term of service was done, Octavian would give the land Antony promised them. If not, they now served Octavian. Even without Octavian's propaganda, it's hard to see what Antony hoped to accomplish, besides abandoning his army and navy for Cleopatra. If he had marched with the rest of his army, he could have retained their loyalty and perhaps even won a battle to turn his fortunes around. At Actium, he could have remained with his navy to have a better withdrawal, rather than leaving them leaderless. Now only a fraction of his navy remained loyal to him, and thousands of men died for his lost cause at Actium. Antony's apparent focus was getting Cleopatra and her interests out of Actium safely. Octavian's propaganda proved true after all. Antony made it to Alexandria with his lover and her treasury, but his war was lost. No Roman would ever rally to Antony's cause again. You're dead in this town. 